All right, so we have Danielle, Madam Love, and Rebecca here on the stage, and I'm just going to ask a few questions based on their traditional and their digital art practices and how they've been navigating this space. So if anyone has questions afterwards, um, please feel free to either pull us for a chat or a drink later, maybe. OK, so I might start with all three of you. Um, just a quick brief history of, of your um, trajectory in this space. Do you want me to start? Cool. Uh, so my name's Danielle. I have been an artist uh, for 12 years now. I started as a traditional artist on canvas and then I evolved um, and transitioned into murals, large scale murals. And uh, I've been in the Web3 space, NFT space, uh, coming up to two years now. So. It's been a great ride and um, I'm still doing all of the above, so still battling out big murals and um, I've dropped three collections and also still working on canvases and brand collaborations as well. Hey, I'm Madam Love, aka Kyra, and I have been an artist ever since I was little. I was one of those kids that was always drawing or, you know, even outside grabbing leaves and making mandalas or something. Um, so it was very inevitable that I would finally pursue that career. And I've been in NFTs now for about a year. Yep, so I've been in NFTs now for a year and um, I've made a lot of mistakes. I've learned a lot. It's been a fun ride being really colourful with my art. And yeah, I'm really excited to be sitting here with all these incredible inspirational ladies. Awesome, and uh, my name's Rebecca. Um, I have painted uh, pretty much my entire life. Uh, I remember doing art classes. Uh, it was the one thing mum could afford to pay for when uh, I was younger. And um, then, but my art, artist career, I guess, um, you know, I did a financial plan. Um, and it was seven years, and then with the pandemic and um, where, where Web3 is going um, and where my business was at, I brought everything forward. Um, and so shit's just gone crazy uh, for me uh, in the last sort of, since May, since I went to VCon. Amazing. Thank you so much for that, ladies. So as a, as a gallerist and a curator, um, and, and potentially there's some more in the audience there, um, I just wanted to ask Danielle, have you encountered any pushback from your traditional collectors or brands that you've collaborated with in the past in regards to moving into the NFT space? Yeah, de definitely. I think um, predominantly my audience is on Instagram uh, and, you know, my Web3 uh, audience and community was on Instagram, so there was a lot of pushback initially there. I think the audience was quite cold. Uh, I do believe I've started to have more conversations with the bigger brands and corporations in the last, you know, six months to a year, so they're more open to it. Um, so it's more so the general public that, and, and, you know, my, I guess, regular collectors and buyers that uh, there was a bit of pushback and questioning and wondering why I was going into the space. But I believe that, you know, I believe in the space and I think the only way to onboard them is to keep pushing. So I've, I've done that on all of my platforms, so... Appreciate yes. that. Sometimes <laughs> it is hard to sort of have those sort of stand your ground as an artist and say, look, this is this is the trajectory I would like to take and I'm gonna continue to build both sides of my practice. Um, so get out of the way. Definitely <laughs> challenging, but it's yeah, it's what we all need to do collectively. We just gotta keep pushing and we're not we're not going backwards, so move aside. <laughs> Good on you. And Rebecca, talking about your new project that's upcoming, Moods, um, I know you speak a lot around um, wanting to really um, gauge a broad audience with that through collaboration with other creatives and other businesses and stuff like that. Do you want to talk a little bit about um, the path of collaboration for Moods? Yeah, absolutely. So I started doing ceramic classes um, last year and... Uh, one of my favourite uh, favorite Australian artists, Ramesh, was a sculpture. And I tried to um, make my own cool sculpture. And then out of it, the, the first mood came, which ended up being called Ego. And they're two-faced um, characters, uh, statues, that represent um, different emotions that we feel. And we have 108 as humans. Um, but what we've done really well in this Web 2, Web 3 world is learn how to mask how we actually feel. And so... Um, 
that's where the two faces came from. And then um, now testing that sort of with, with children and them understanding now what we mean about being able to pretend you feel some way and actually feel a different way because they can see that in something. And so I own two childcare centres in Brisbane, our early childhood, um, and we opened a primary school. And so we've tested this concept. I, I did my first solo exhibition uh, in October, so it was a full uh, a full gallery showing, but I did it with the Oz NFT boys. I, I met um, Josh over in, in Beacon and uh, got them to run the NFT side of it, but for me it was experimental. We, everything was a physical piece, but it also had the digital NFT to go with it. And I really wanted to get anecdotal evidence of what is the, the normies, that, as I've learned people call them, uh, is, is people in different demographics, how do they actually um, translate when it comes to NFTs and where those obstacles are and it was an amazing experience to have and so those moods now are becoming a, a curriculum, mental health um, and, and emotional literacy that ACARA, our national curriculum in schools, doesn't have um, and we're using the moods to do that through gamification, um, an app where you know, they can, they can talk to each other, they can tell parents how they're feeling. Um, and so, you know, but I did the clay, I did the, the ceramic work, but I got a Ukrainian female artist to do the, the illustrations of them. And, and it's all, I think, my whole life has been about collaboration and I think that that's what uh, the Magic Web 3 allows for, is all those dots to connect and for everybody to have a voice and for everybody to be creative in the way that creativity shows up for them. Because um, I believe everybody's an artist, um, just in different ways, and I, I think we have the chance to empower people to do that and we can only change the world and humanity through collaboration. That's awesome. And for anyone who hasn't seen them, we, uh, Oshi, got delivered a, got the first a ever, custom The first ever tailored one, yeah. Mood, and, mm -hmm. and I think the project is, is about sort of externalising a, a, an element to look at um, for potentially an internal issue that we don't actually see visual part of an emotion. So I think it's really cool, um, especially working through collaboration with that. Yeah. Um, so, Madam Love, you are new to me and I have been stalking the hell out of you and I think your work is absolutely beautiful and Thank I've you. seen, um, you know, different elements to your practice, which is, which is really interesting as someone from, that wants to learn from artists about their practice and how they're evolving. Um, so, after my mad stalking of you um, and your beautiful colour use and, and um, textures and stuff like that, um, I did want to know a little bit more about how learning the new digital skills um, has sort of helped excel you in the NFT space and the digital art space. Absolutely. So it definitely took a fair bit of time. Um, I, one does not just jump straight onto Photoshop and produce the same level of work as what you can with Canvas. Uh, so I actually really made the most of that and just did not put any pressure whatsoever when I was experimenting and explored all the different styles that I do with my other mediums when I was on there. And then finally, after months, I had the beautiful... Um, like accumulation of everything coming together and really streamlined and doing the digital art, although it took some time to yeah, wrap my head around it, just opened doors for me to express myself in such a clear way. And, you know, I adore how you can just completely rework a canvas and, you know, play with the colours in such a way that, you know, you might be in a certain mood and emotion when you create a piece, but then you can completely change it without spending all that painstaking time of reworking a canvas completely from scratch. Yeah, so, yeah. and I think we were discussing that earlier on about, um, you know, moving into the digital space and being able to access a colour gamut that is, you know, not available in um, acrylics and oils and stuff like that. So that's been able to sort of help bolster your artwork to another level. Absolutely, yeah. You know, and it's, and it's gone in conjunction with everything else that's happened in my life with beating an immune, autoimmune disease. Um, back then, I, I was struggling with energy and mood levels, I was very depressed, so a lot of my work was black and white. And then coming into digital and I've got all this energy, I beat that now and it's just a whole new world, a whole new way of expressing and it's, it's so uplifting. Yeah, I mean, that's fantastic for you to have, have found that sort of change in your personality and growth um, by utilising that space. So this is a question for all of you ladies, and since you're holding the mic... Oh, we'll go... Yeah, go to Danielle. Yeah, why not? Why not? Um, 
So I just wanted to know what the biggest learning curve has been um, for you, Danielle. I know I've heard you speak a few times about sort of overcoming different things um, from trad to um, coming into the NFT space, but like what was the biggest hurdle that you've sort of been able to go, fuck yeah, this is a win for me. I, I've done this, I've learned it, and now I can help sort of express to other people how I've dealt with that. That's a good question. I think there's multiple hurdles, as we all know. <laughs> Ongoing. Uh, look, I think one of the biggest things for artists is balance is balance, really. And I think having to learn something new and still be able to create is such a big <laughs> balancing act. And I think, you know, it's forced me to get some systems in place and, you know, ask for help and build a team so, yeah, balance would definitely be one of the, the challenges. And I think we, yeah, like it's, it's, it's really hard. It's really difficult. And I think, um, you know, we want to be everywhere. We want to be on spaces. We want to be, you know, trying to still live and, and build up our Web2 business and still trying to create. And you need to be, have a really good mindset and a clear mindset to create as well. So I think don't be, um, don't let the fear of, getting into this space because of the time that you actually have to invest in learning it, um, overcome or overpower the, your ability to be, create, to, to be able to create consistently still. Um, know what, where your roots are and where your priorities lie and, and to be good humans, we need to create. So I think that's probably the priority and, and definitely a good challenge to, to balance. Yes, yeah. that's very good advice <laughs> indeed. Uh, for me, it would have been the, um, you know, that starving artist mentality or, or thing that you hear out there. Uh, luckily enough, I have an entrepreneurial background. And so for me, I instead of buying into that uh, mentality, um, I investigated and I went and I went to gallery openings and I met the gallery owner in, in, in Brisbane and asked for time and, and sat with him. He... he he recommended a book that or every artist should read. So I read the book and then I went back to him and actually he never really fully read the book. He just skimmed it and then from, from the data that I was going back to him with, he was, he was coming back. So I went and explored why we have that mental block uh, for, for, for artists and why society that is our, our, our story so that I could just stay away from it and, and really have that self-belief. But that self-worth would be the hardest part in owning the identity as being an artist and knowing to ensure, knowing I've built things up to ensure that I'm taken seriously for that. Yeah, yeah I agree. That's, that's a great point. And I really just have to kind of echo what both of these ladies have done is much similar to my own journey. Um, and being so self-determined to do it all yourself means that it can be a really big challenge because not only are you learning terminology, but each of the chains are completely different and the way that you're putting your art onto them um, is, is very different. And I also believe as an artist, especially at this beginning stage where there's so much potential across the chains, you do want to look at diversifying and exploring and, and trying new things and seeing which um, chain and community is actually going to benefit you the most. And now my learning curve is taking all that knowledge and experience from the last year and finding the best way to communicate it in order to mentor other artists. Yeah, so are you a coder yet or have you written smart contracts yet? <laughs> I have been making my own contracts, but it's through Manifold or uh, Third Web. So yeah, I fantastic. Cheat a little How bit. have you found the, the Manifold process, the creating your own contracts? Is it giving you a bit more flexibility or...? Yeah, absolutely. I've actually, um, I really enjoy Manifold. It's it's quite intuitive and... They are sponsoring this um, talk, by the way. No, I'm joking. They're not. <laughs> They're not at all. <laughs> yeah, no, it has given some great freedom and I love, you know, the test net as well so that you can completely just double check over everything, see how it's going to look, um, have it be so intuitive and clearly laid out. Um, same with Third Web, actually. I did have to lean on a few friends with it, but... Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So all three of these ladies are just doing it for themselves. It seems like you're doing everything. Um, and, and on that, I do know that we discussed a little bit, Rebecca, that there was a bit of... Um, a bit of the start of you coming into the process where you sort of did lean on a few other people to sort of help um, in terms of, like... 
funneling the core information that you needed to extract from them. So how has that sort of participation from another person helped you get into the space a bit more rapidly? Um, as someone who has built a number of businesses over time, I knew that the way in which Web3 and how fast we move in this world, that there is no way that I was going to be able to continue building and doing what I'm doing in life and learn everything that I needed to do. So I was, I, I am in a position where I, I was able to afford to pay um, the Oz NFT guys to do the NFT element of it. You know, I, I did enough research to know what smart contracts were, what needed to happen, but I don't have the, the time to do the tech side and all of that sort of stuff. So um, I was in a position to be able to outsource elements of that. And, you know, uh, as an artist, you were saying before, Danielle, you know, I, I was able to hire a PA for myself, um, you know, this year. And, and someone who who I'm, I hire, not the business, it's me. And so that I can ensure that that balance that we talk about, I can do, but she can do the things that I'm not great at, and that might be making appointments, making sure I've got enough paint, all of those sort of things that she did in the lead up to the exhibition. And so I think you've got to find a way to delegate and not do everything yourself if you can, um, but you've also got to have the fire under your belly to do it all if you have to, to get what you want. And so I think that that's important. And, and uh, from what I can see with these ladies, they do that. I was just in a different position um, having built what I had before. Yeah, amazing, amazing. So this is sort of, this is a sneaky little question that I want to know the response from these girls, so I'm not sure if they're aware of this yet. Um, but uh, for, for spaces like ourself, um, Oshi Gallery, that is, uh, we are a physical digital gallery. Um, we showcase um, digital artists and physical artists as well. And if those artists work in both practices, we like to show that off to the public. Um, what can galleries and curators like ourselves do better to help you guys come into the space more comfortably? Is, it, is there things that we can offer you or make us more approachable to artists like yourself um, wanting to enter the space? I think, like, shout out to you and GT because you guys are the OGs in the space. And I think you're doing above and beyond for not just artists, but builders and everyone, all of the above. So thank you. Uh, look, I've only just had my first exhibition. I've been on this journey for 12 years. And I've only just had a <laughs> shout out to, um, to Upside Dow because they provided me with the space which is similar to yours. Um, and I think just knowing that you're there and knowing that you're there to help um, and saying like, hey, this is what we can do for you. Because I actually, did, you know, I've been an artist for so long, but I, I didn't, I don't really know what curatorship <laughs> entails. I had no idea. So it wasn't until uh, Alessandra sitting in here somewhere, she, my right hand man, woman. Um, <laughs> but we put it all together. And I'm like, whoa, there's a lot of work involved. And that's probably what is so daunting for artists. So. I think even just, you know, having a pitch deck that says, hey, this is what we can do for you, um, even when, you know, you came and said, do you want to do an NFT with us? I'm like, oh, my God, is this a possibility? This is awesome. What an opportunity. So sometimes I think, you know, we're, we're so, we live in such a fast pace and, and fast-moving world that we think that people know what we can offer, but really they don't. So I think that's even, you know, when you said, you said to me, oh, I wish I would have known it was your first show, like we would have had you, and it's just having those conversations, really. And I think... Um, if everyone can just take a few notes out of yours and GT's book, then we'll all be in a, in a better place and just the support that you offer artists and, and just being there is more than enough. So hopefully that's helpful. I don't know. Went on a little tangent there. but <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. And I guess speaking on, on behalf of the, the traditional gallery owners that I, that I sat with and spoke to and, and, and we met before you, you opened um, is that... You know, you guys get hammered with hundreds of people a month, um, artists trying to break it through and, and all of these sort of things. I think what, what galleries could do is actually know what your strengths are, know what your style is, and work out a way to communicate that so that you don't get smashed by people. But it also saves the time and energy of the artists trying to find, you know, where to fit what they do. So I think just better communication of what you're looking for um, and what your style is because we curation is extremely difficult. But you know, that's your profession, right? But hundreds of artists who are coming and trying to break through don't know how that works. So finding a way to communicate that better, I think, would give you time back, give the artist time back and actually make those connections and relationships stronger, faster. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. 
Yeah, I think also from my perspective, it's not something that I have too much experience with yet, but it's definitely in the pipelines and what I'm focused on. And I would definitely need to have um, or would love to have a clear idea of what I need to be uh, clear on and have ready so that the whole process is as seamless as possible and maybe an idea of what sort of support is actually offered. So if all that's outlined, then I know what I need to take responsibility for from the get-go. Agreed, yeah. And I mean, as, as, as ladies that are doing a lot of it on their own, I think having those kind of that messaging correctly laid out so you know what to just get, head down, bum up and get done. <laughs> grants, some, some grants do it really well in regards to what they're focusing and, and, and what they're doing. If you take a leaf out of the ATO's book and they tell you what they're looking for this year, you know, that sort of thing gets clarity and then you either bother applying or not, um, but yeah. it just gives that clarity. Yeah. So, um, Danielle, we'll hand the mic back to you. You've had some successes in your past. Um, you've got an incredible social media following off the back of some amazing, and this is, we haven't been over any of these questions, so she's, she didn't know I was going to throw this one to her. Um, also just done a physical and a digital exhibition. And what next? What next for Danielle Weber? Aside from the fact that Danielle um, is also curated in an exhibition in the vault um, just a couple of doors down here and has an NFT for sale there. But aside from that, what next? It's always the golden question. Uh, I have a lot of murals that I need to catch up on <laughs> between now and Christmas. So that's the, the, um, the next few weeks for me. But uh, for the longer term, uh, I think we've all learned that education is key in this space and... Th what I wanted to do with my first exhibition was really marry my Web 2 and my Web 3 family together and, um, and, and, and show that, hey, this is my physical art, this is my digital art, and, and put, you know, both of my artworks in a, in a place and, and show that it works. It really does work. We can, um, we can make it happen and the only way that we're going to onboard people and push forward in this space if, is if we start having these conversations um, on, a, on a larger scale. And so seeing that as, as my first exhibition um, and watching how well everyone, you know, meshed together and how beautiful the energy was in the room has really made me realise that education is key and, and starting to have these conversations. So I'm building an online platform which all of my NFT holders will have access to and I think mentoring and inspiring other artists has become my purpose and I know that it's going, you know, time is, is very precious and it's going to get harder and harder to mentor one-on-one. -on -one. So I think building an online platform which will onboard, onboard NFT creators and also, um, you know, things that have taken me 10 years to figure out artists will have access to, how to run a business, you know, we're not the best business people as artists, um, how to do murals, how, you know, what insurances you need. There's so much that is involved, as you know, Jane. So... I think that's that's what's next, and um, and obviously I'm passionate about uh, getting kids uh, on board as a young age and tapping into that um, that side of their brain. So yeah, whether that's an NFT project that um, you can we can play around with, there's a few things that that's are good to know. <laughs> yes, in the pipeline. So lots lots on. Yeah, awesome. And uh, for you, you go, you go. whichever, whichever. Go um, that's so amazing. I had no idea you were doing that. So I'm also looking at uh, mentoring as well. But I think uh, I'm going to be building off the course that I just completed for Meta Academy. So focusing a lot more on uh, the chain and the minting side as well as, you know, what I've learned about marketing and, and being a part of the Web3 NFT community. Um, as soon as I finish NFT Fest, I have a custom portrait that I need to complete, also a mural's coming up, and yeah, I'm, I'm very much open to, you know, partnering or collaborating with, you know, an aligned project or something that will utilise my creativity and communication skills. Yeah, so you've always sort of participated in murals and stuff like that as well as another practice? I've completed a few murals, yeah. Yeah, yeah. just a few. <laughs> How have you found scaling your work? to a mural? Definitely challenging and my first ever mural I picked the worst wall possible. It was like brick and lumpy and had big lines and massive and it definitely taught me the hard way. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's it's really enjoyable it, and you can get it done 
so much quicker sometimes because you're expanding the piece and so it's easier to cover larger areas instead of being so finite with finite on on canvas yeah yeah, yeah. and rebecca for you what's next with moods um, a lot. So um, when when I went to VCon, um, I, uh, the, I my my brain went crazy, and I got to do that moment where you like knock everything off a table and put paper down and like write your idea out. Um, and so the trial, ex the solo exhibition I did here was a trial um, to see what that would look like if I was to do a side event at VCon, um, wherever it was going to be. Uh, next year, and so now knowing that that's in Indianapolis, um, one of the, the the guys here is from Non Essential, and that you know he's sourced a, a venue for me to hold this uh, exhibition in there. But this is about uh, it's all about emotions and moods, but it's it's physical artists from each continent. So the continents project element, which is also Montessori education under there, um, and then digital artists combining two of those physical works into a digital piece as well. So showing true collaboration, but using physical um, and digital artists. Uh, in that space um, to ensure that, you know, it's seen because anxiety is different in Australia than it is in China. Um, and so exploring emotions across cultural barriers and country uh, borders, I think, is, is going to be fascinating to see. Um, and so that's the, the art exhibition side. And then for the moods, um, as I said, we've got the education platform coming out, the, the, the app um, that will turn them into. We had, we've, we've already had plush toys um, made we've got from birth to, to the end of life type scenario happening and so I, I'm I'm in the middle of, of starting to go for funding um, so whether that's private equity VC um, to take this this all the way and and uh, I just wanted to add in that I ensured that the moods as a concept is not is truly inclusive and that means that we, we did a test exhibition with children where they made moods out of paper and Play-Doh, and that meant that the, there was no requirement to, to get involved in the community um, via money. And so that was important for me to, tr to truly look at that at a, as a global scale um, from an art perspective and, and, a, and a, a brand perspective. So um, I'm all in for teaching people about emotions and changing the world using art um, and emotional literacy. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I think a couple of ladies on the floor could probably have have a bit of fun creating some moods as well, like if you want to get your hands dirty and get into a, a, a crafternoon or something. Yes, please. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so I'm not quite sure if anyone in the audience has any questions for these ladies, any artists or galleries or curators. If not, I have some more questions of my own. But does anyone in the audience have any questions? Oh. Why is it, what, have we got a hand up? up yes, there? we do. Go right ahead, mate. Use Why, your While I run this mic up, Jane, can you tell us, because obviously Danielle is one of the artists, how do we actually get our hands on these NFTs in the vault? So two people, you go and grab the screen and you lift it. No, I'm joking. Please don't touch the screens. <laughs> um, so Oshi Gallery, in collaboration with uh, NFT Fest, has actually handpicked um, four panellists um, from across the NFT Fest and another six um, Australian-based artists um, that work in the NFT space. So all of the artwork, the 10 screens in the vault, a couple of doors down, is part of the NFT Fest um, curation. Danielle has a piece in there. Um, you may have heard a few of the other artists or, or heard of them. Um, we curated that show really to showcase everyone that comes through the doors here, um, the diversity of artists from photography, music, um, Danielle's traditional art practice where she's painted and then animated her work. So all of the NFTs in the vault are available to purchase for $40. Um, you can scan the app, you can buy with credit card if you don't have cryptocurrencies. Um, and they're available till 9am on Monday as an open edition. And it's super high quality artwork. Like I was just overwhelmed with what these artists have put forward for this exhibition. So it's all original work. Um, straight from the source, right? So Danielle's been um, learning how to how to actually animate her um, traditional work as well, which is just a really important thing for artists to sort of take that sort of 
their whole concept and like really work through that as well. So please, if you want to go in there and check out the artwork, share it, retweet it, whatever, purchase one. I believe GT's on a mission to get to Miami. <laughs> um, but we'll, <laughs> we'll see. I kind of need him here, but anyway. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so please um, share it around, buy one for a friend, flick it over as a Christmas present or something. There's your first NFT. Um, we also have the entire exhibition um, down at Oshi Gallery. So if you have friends or family that were unable to make it to NFT Fest, jump down to Oshi Gallery on Smith Street, grab a bar me and check out the exhibition there as well. Um, it'll be running for another week. So kids, kid friendly, we might do a couple of Sunday beers as well down there if anyone wants to join. <laughs> if we're not all hung over by then. Oh, good <laughs> Yes. Sorry, to the question? Uh, yeah. Um, in my experience selling paintings, uh, especially to, like, more notable collectors or getting in notable collections, often there's a bit of a, of a gate barrier uh, in the form of who's collected your pieces beforehand, what collections do you already ex uh, uh, have works in. Uh, have either of you guys ever had similar experiences selling uh, tangible works? And have you had similar experiences within the NFT space and like the NFT collectors that you guys have collecting your work? Uh, essentially what I'm asking is, do, does, does your collector base uh, matter in the NFT space as opposed to the tangible one? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that was something that was most enticing for me. I've done hundreds and hundreds of paintings over the last 12 years and I have no idea where they've ended up and if they've been unsold, um, for how much, if they've been destroyed. So I think that was probably one of the biggest things for me is being able to see where my artwork ends up and who owns it and then being able to give back to that collector. So uh, I've only, I've done three collections and everyone's held. They've, I've not had any secondary sales yet. So, um, but I know every single one of my collectors and I think that's so beautiful because I can now keep track of who has my art and say, hey, I'm running this exhibition and, and contact them and I will do so for many years to come. So I think that's really, really important and something that um, we need to, I guess, drive home for artists as well. Um, it's, you know, I was speaking about royalties before, I completely agree with everything um, Theo said and... That is another point too, is just knowing who has your art. And you know, I, I, my brother walked into a rental property and saw a piece that I'd done eight years ago and I had no idea who had bought it, but it had my signature on there. So, yeah, definitely a really important point and a good question. I hope I answered that correctly. I hope that was, yeah, cool. So I can, um, I can speak to that from a, a gallerist standpoint as well. Um, having run traditional galleries for way too long, probably 15 years now, um, We've always catalogued every every sale. Um, we have the physical um, printouts. We've always sent out COAs with a, a lot of the artwork. And my Excel spreadsheets are out of this world tracking who bought what, where it was shipped to, and how much they paid for it. The issue has always been in the traditional space that, um, you know, my partner, uh, GT, back in 2016, 2017, was looking at blockchain to help sort of um, manage that information in a more, like, sustainable, ongoing way. Um, was that I still get people emailing me, oh, I saw this piece of art on eBay and they told me they bought it from your gallery. Can you tell me if it's real? And I'm like, well where's their transaction from our gallery? Like, they're just saying they bought it from there, but if you look at Google, you can find those websites that are, were our galleries. So it's really hard, and, and then people are asking me what value it's worth now. I don't know, was it hung in a window? Was it, you know, has it been in a fire? Like, all of those kinds of things um, we found in the digital space, it's like... It's actually just taking a lot of that out. Um, and that's not to say that traditional art, um, we, we never want that to disappear, but if we can tie some kind of um, informational store with the, with the traditional art, I think moving forward it's going to help collectors 
um, feel more confident about the value of the work in, in the current time, um, potentially the trajectory of value um, over years to come. So for me, damn, I'm over spreadsheets, I'm over Excel, I'm over people on eBay asking me how much work is worth now when they bought it from us, you know, 10 years ago. I want to do the right thing by the artist as well, ensuring that, you know, people are selling the, the correct artwork as well and it's not a knockoff like we do see quite a lot of work we've shown before instantly being either ripped off, replicated or um, flipped in, in other galleries for a um, gigantic um, profit, which is, it is what it is, it's totally fine, um, but sometimes they take images from our website and sell it before they've even actually purchased it from us. <laughs> so, yes, I mean, the NFT space is, is definitely going to help um, with a lot of that sort of thing, or blockchain in general. There was a um, there was a Melbourne artist, Mysterious Al, who's freaking amazing, and um, I, was, I was able to see him sell his first physical piece with the NFC in the back of it, and and um, it it be bought because I was at the gallery when when uh, Lynn um, from Twitter bought it, and um, and seeing it in her we're on a road trip at the at the moment, and um, we went to her her space and I got to see that on her um, wall. So I got to see it in the gallery. I got to track it through OpenSea and the Providence and, and seeing it all there, and then seeing it on the actual collector's wall and seeing how he's done it so that that Providence um, can continue to be collated, um, and I think that this is. To, to be able to see that myself was like, all right, this is literally going to change everything. And I think we don't have to wait till we die before our art has more value. I think Web3 allows us to build that um, value while we're still here um, to appreciate it. And that's through all the royalties, through the online branding, everything. And, um, and so I think for an artist, it's completely transformational in more ways than one. Yeah, absolutely. Are there any more questions? Well, Sorry. Do you mind if I... I yeah, also, no, please speak to it. I also think it's really important um, and it all comes down to you as an artist, how much value you're offering and, you know, the connection that you're establishing with your collectors because that's what's going to stop them from actually, you know, taking in consideration that sort of thing. Um, Web3 is so beautiful in that it, it just allows uh, the... Yeah, sorry. But I'm just answering the question that, um, like, have you been having issues with other collectors, sorry. Oh, good. You're it's right? three o'clock in the afternoon, nearly. Yes, I know, yeah. I'm, I'm nearly yawning. Um, so I've got a, I've got a, a rapid fire question um, and, uh, and I'll, I'll throw it to all three of you ladies, one by one. Danielle, most inspirational project or artist in the NFT space for you? I told you this one before, I just, Lambie, is she in the room? Yes. Hey. Yes. Bloody love your work and she does not give a flying F and I that inspires me and I think most like I said to Jane before I met the 70% don't don't care and I think all of us artists need to have more of that approach and go girl love your work. <laughs> there you go. She is really awesome. I met her yesterday and I was fangirling but I I don't think I made it um, obvious. I love Avril 15. I think they're incredible for a project. I adore how um, they are both physical and digital. They make everything with their ink before they colour it in digitally and mint. And you can go on their Discord and it's like reading a graphic novel and the way that they've built their community so organically and it's turned out to be this epic thing. It's just so inspirational as well as the colours and the level of detail in their art. I, I love it. Have you slid into their DMs yet? A little bit, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Rebecca, most inspirational project or, or artist? Um, I'm going to say V Friends, and the reason for that is that was my first ever mint and the first ever time I touched crypto, um, and I did pretty well with that. Um, but for me, it was also the fact that he was a pretty shit drawer. Um, <laughs> And he was able to still express that creativity and then to see it develop with, with that collaboration element. So I think that was probably the, the, the project that aligns with me the most. But internally in Australia, Sisterhood Club, I think, is going to be massive. And I think that that is where my alignment is from a, from a, from a favourite Australian project. Yeah. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for talking to me. And, um, you know, I've 
of, of love meeting you as well, Madam Love. Now you're on my you're on my peeps. So um, thanks to everybody for listening. If anyone has any questions around these ladies, they'll be hovering around for the. Uh, you can slide the into the my DMs. Invitation. I would say it would be the same for both. Um, and the rest of the Oshi team, uh, GT and Ant are here as well um, as Dundo. We'll, we're, we're rotating around in, in the vault if anyone wants to pull us for a chat. So thank you all. Thank you. And thank you, Greg. Like, what you guys have done is incredible and I think it's um, transforming this sector. So thank you for supporting Australia. <laughs>